Now, in 1957, which is one year before I was born, a doctor named Merz, M-E-R-Z, Walter Merz, by the way, uh, could make in a laboratory, uh, laboratory rats generate type 2 diabetes or not. He could turn type 2 diabetes on or off in laboratory rats at will. And how did he do it? He did it by messing with the levels of chromium in the blood of the laboratory rat. So he would give them little rat chow that had chromium in it, or he'd give them rat chow without chromium in it. And when he gave them rat chow without chromium in it, guess what? They got type 2 diabetes. They developed blood sugar issues. And when he put the chromium back into their diets, the type 2 diabetes went away. The blood sugars normalized. Years later, there was an Indian doctor. His name was Gigi Boy. He was working at some hospital in New England. I forget if it was uh, BU or Tufts or wherever it was. But Gigi Boy, uh, because he couldn't handle the English language very well, Dr. Gigi Boy, the MDs at the hospital put him in the back room and just let him do some research until his English came up to snuff because, you know, they didn't want him uh, to kill a patient because of there was a language difference. And, you know, he meant to say go left and then uh, take off the left leg. And instead he said take off the right leg or whatever. So Gigi Boy uh, started doing research, and he noticed that patients in the coma ward, patients who were uh, unconscious in comas, after three or four weeks of being in a coma, they all developed type 2 diabetes, 100%. 100% development of type 2 diabetes of coma patients who were unconscious for more than a couple of weeks. And Gigi Boy thought to himself, well, that's curious. That has to either be because of something that is in the stomach tubes that the coma patients were on, because they're all on stomach tubes, because they're all, you know, unconscious. And so they're feeding them with stomach tubes, parenteral nutrition through stomach tubes. That's how they kept them alive. And Gigi Boy thought to himself, son of a gun, it has to be either something that's in the food that we're giving them or something that's not in the food that we're giving them. So he started doing a review of the literature, and he came upon Merz's work. And so he had this remarkable insight, and he said, well, son of a gun, I'm going to bet you that the food that we're giving these coma patients doesn't have any chromium in it. So what did he do? He started adding chromium into the feeding tubes, food-grade chromium into the feeding tubes of the coma patients, and within seven days of doing that, the type 2 diabetes disappeared, and then he would remove the chromium from the diets and Within uh, two weeks, the type 2 diabetes came back, and he published his results and brought them to his medical professionals. And the editor of the journal, I don't know if you've ever uh, read a medical journal, but when you read a medical journal, what you see is the editor of the journal, especially if it's a controversial article, will make a little, um, have a little comment, right? The editor of the journal comments about the research that they're publishing if it's a little controversial. And the editor's comment of G.G. Boy's research was, Dr. G.G. Boy's results must have been placebo. That's what he said, and it was printed and, and, and published. Must have been placebo. G.G. Boy's research must have worked on the placebo method because we all know that type 2 diabetes is genetic and that there's no cure for type 2 diabetes. And there he had the evidence right in front of his face. And how can a coma patient um, be uh, the subject of a placebo experiment? Well, you can't be the subject of a placebo experiment. It's nonsense. And this is why you are not to trust the MDs. Because they come at the world of medicine with uh, rose-colored glasses on. They don't know that they have rose-colored glasses on, and their information is always biased, and it is a big, bad voodoo daddy. Lupus is no exception. A medical doctor will tell you that lupus is an autoimmune disease. Lupus is not an autoimmune disease. They've gotten it completely backwards. We're going to go to Michigan and talk to Mark all about it. Hey, Mark, thanks for calling. You are live. Yeah, hi, Dr. Wood, and I appreciate you taking my call. Yeah, um, yeah, so what's up? Yeah, I'm calling about a friend of mine who has lupus, and I'm just trying to figure out what's the best nutrition here from your program that I could uh, talk with her about taking. 
Yeah, okay, so I did a really good webinar on lupus a couple months ago. If you're a member of my online health recovery uh, team, you can go into the archives and pull up the webinar. It's uh, about 45 minutes long, and it tells you everything there is to know about this illness. Long story, long story short, though, you know, I'll tell you for the listening audience, right, from our point of view, lupus, which is um, supposed to be, according to the MDs, an autoimmune disease. It's a disease wherein somehow the body decided that it's okay to attack itself, and the body has actually developed antibodies against itself, and so the body is chewing up its own tissue. This is what the MDs think. They have no idea what causes it and they're completely 100% off base. From our point of view, lupus is no different than the process that generates lupus is no different than the process that happens to a dead, decomposing animal body on the side of the road. I don't know if you've ever looked at a dead, decomposing animal body on the side of the road. I think every boy in the United States has done that. You know, they found a dead cat or a dead dog or a dead rat or something on the side of the road, and you kick it over and look at it. Well, what happens? After three or four days, the animal starts to become infested with little parasitic organisms that are chewing up the carcass. They're chewing up the carcass. Well, the same thing happens inside the human body. When there is chronic inflammation, and I mean inflammation, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for months at a time, the body tissue starts to degenerate and decompose, and you've got dead tissue in the body. And the body's continuing to destroy tissue every day, not because it's built antibodies against itself, but because there's chronic inflammation afoot in the body. And why is there chronic inflammation afoot? Because the person is consistently eating all of the wrong foods. The foods are causing inflammation and then the body does not have the requisite amount of nutrients to put those fires of inflammation out. It can't put the fires out, so the inflammation becomes a runaway train. It becomes a wildfire, and tissue in the body starts to become destroyed on a regular basis. Now, when there's a runaway inflammatory process happening inside the body, the body freaks out. The body pays attention to the laws of nature. The body is subjected to the laws of nature. The body cannot work outside of the laws of nature, so what does the body do? The body generates antibodies to clean up, eat, and eliminate the dead, destroyed tissue so that gangrene doesn't set in. So that's where the antibodies come from. So the body creates antibodies to clean up the inflammatory mess, but the medical doctor, because they're idiotic, old-fashioned, out-of-date, one-sided, lopsided, and they've got the thumb of the pharmaceutical industry so far up their rear end that they can't even think straight, the medical doctor looks at the presence of the antibody and then determines that it was the antibody that caused the illness. It's the antibody's fault, which has never been proven. It is 100% not in keeping with even the fundamental laws of physics or the fundamental laws of biochemistry, I should say. It is uh, reality by consensus. One medical doctor someplace in some medical journal years ago said it was the antibody that causes the inflammatory reaction, and every medical doctor in the world agreed because this is how these people think. They're like lemmings following each other over the cliff. They have no intellectual integrity, and they are all 100% intellectual cowards, and I'm choosing my words carefully. They have duped an entire generation, two generations now, of people into believing in their myth of the autoimmune disease, and it is nonsense. The same way that they've duped an entire generation into believing in the myth of the BRCA gene. And I've talked about that before. So from our point of view, lupus is the culmination of weeks, months, and years, probably, of a chronic, unbridled, out-of-control inflammatory process in the human body, which has its roots deeply embedded in malnutrition. We see it all the time. We're up against it hard. Everybody is in wheelchairs. Everybody after 50 years of age is going downhill rapidly. Uh, One-third of American adults are obese. Uh, 300,000 people a year march through death's door because of obesity. Obesity is the most rapidly rising childhood ailment. It's increased by 60%, I think, in our childhood population in the last 20 years. It's nuts. And we look around, we look around at all of this, and because it's so epidemic, we think that it's, it's normal. The medical doctors must be right. It's got to be genetic. Well, it's not genetic. It is the result 
of Betty Crocker. Betty Crocker is the reason for all of this nonsense. Betty Crocker and Monsanto and the food industry and all of those commercials by Kellogg's and Quaker Mills telling you, yeah, that's right, that you need to eat Wonder Bread, you need to eat your granola, you need to eat your cornflakes, you need to eat from the four food groups, your whole grains are the best possible thing you can possibly eat. It's nonsense. It's the worst food that you can possibly eat. Whole grains are the worst food that you can possibly eat. You want to know why? Sign up for my free newsletter at drglidden.com or fireyourmdnow.com. They're mirror sites, drglidden.com or fireyourmdnow.com. And when you sign up for the newsletter, you're going to get a free copy of my video against the grain. It walks you through from step A to step Z why whole grains are bad for you. They're some of the most difficult proteins in the world for your stomach to digest. And when you have an undigested protein tumbling through your digestive tract, things become destroyed. The very tissues that are supposed to be absorbing all of those good whole grain nutrients are destroyed by the evil whole grains. So look, even if you don't understand biochemistry, you understand history, and you can look back, and you know how many kids you grew up with had attention deficit disorder. You know how many kids had autism. None. Zero. You know how many kids were overweight. Very few. You know how many kids died on the football field during a football game. None. Zero. That was because in the baby boomer generation, we didn't eat whole grains when we were kids. That didn't start until, you know, the mid 1960s, 1970s, were already grown by then. For goodness sake, ladies and gentlemen, in the last 30 years, there has been a 65% increase in grain consumption, 65% increase in grain consumption amongst children in the United States. The average teenager eats six bowls of cereal a day. It's the equivalent of six bowls of cereal a day. We wonder why there's so much autism, because all of the 20-somethings now that are getting pregnant have grown up on whole grains. And when you grow up on whole grains, every single time you eat a whole grain, the tissue in your gut that absorbs nutrients gets destroyed a little more. So by the time you're in your 20s, you've had 20 years of tissue destruction in your gut. So your body's running on nutrient fumes. And then if you're lucky enough to get pregnant, which also is why there's so much infertility, because the body does not want to bring a baby into the world in an undernutrified body. It knows if it does, a birth defect is going to be the result. So what happens? The body doesn't want you to get pregnant. And then in the off chance that you do get pregnant, the child is developing in a womb that's completely undernutrified, and this is why kids are born autistic. Now, when you add onto that, Crap in vaccinations, environmental stress, electromagnetic stress, and lions and tigers and bears, you're done. Kid's done. Didn't even have a chance, for goodness sake. This is the world that we live in, brought to you by Bus Driver MD. One more reason to fire them immediately and encourage everybody in your life to do the same. 